Okay, it's 1230, so it's time to start the class. You guys have any questions about anything that we've been covering so far or any other concerns about the class? And I'm seeing no's, no's and no's and no's and no's. Okay, good. Of course, if you do, just type them in anytime. And you can stay after class and talk to me. That's fine. If uh, hopefully you guys are surviving this storm, which appears to be pretty bad and is supposedly going to continue into the weekend. Uh, I don't know how we're going to handle all this rain. Some schools have already closed down because of the rain and the storm that's coming. So uh, hopefully you guys will maintain your connections, internet connections, so that you can get online and do your classes for the rest of the day and tomorrow too. So there are no questions, and I will continue on with where we were in personality, talking about personality. And we were considering the study on the delay of gratification called the marshmallow experiment. And I had talked about some of the positive things that had happened. And then I hear we talk about the negative things that can happen if you cannot delay your gratification. Of course, we try to teach our children gratification, but there's no research that I know that it shows that teaching gratification actually works in stopping the negative attributes of the delay of gratification. Now, we may be able to teach it to our, our children or may not be able to teach it to our children very well, but um, even if we can teach it, it doesn't mean that we will get the positive results of it. Those positive results may be effective because of something that actually caused the delay of gratification in the first place, we don't know. And that's part of the problems with science. There's lots of research that has to be done before you know the answers. So personality uh, conne is connected to temperament. Part of our personality is our temperament and our traits, which we'll talk about next, is the basic inherited personality dispositions that are apparent in early childhood and establish the tempo and the moods of an individual's behavior, which means their personality is, is affected by their temperaments. Uh, Jerome Kagan is a psychologist who studied shyness and boldness in children, and he found that 10 to 15 percent of the population is born, born very shy, and 10 to 15 percent of the population is born very outgoing or gregarious, bold, and the rest of us are somewhere in between. And there is going to be, if 40% of your personality is based on genetics and the rest of it is based on what happens in your environment, if you are shy, your environment's going to be very different than a person who has a bold personality. They're going to be out there in the world all the time, not, not considering the fact that uh, there's something that might make them fearful or shy. And uh, they, all, they will have a much different environment than another person will, and so their personality will be affected by this genetic characteristic, shyness or boldness. And temperament sets a range within which the individual develops corresponding to the environmental influences. There's a great book called Personality Plus. If you have any of you taken the test that I put out there for Personality Plus and your temperaments, has anyone taken that test yet? I don't see any yeses at all. Okay, not yet, says Quinn. No, no. Okay, well, I hope that you will take it before next Tuesday, and then on Tuesday you can put down in the little chat box what personality characteristic was your main characteristic. In Personality Plus, it talks about the Hippocrates humors, and Hippocrates had four different temperaments, four different temperaments. You are not a single temperament. You are a combination of temperaments. But one of them is going to be your main temperament. And it'd be interesting to see how many of you are one type or another temperament and who has the same temperaments. So take the test. Uh, it is from the Personality Plus book. And I do give you a little synopsis of what your temperament means. But... Uh, I did not give you the full explanation. If you want the full explanation, then you'll have to buy the book. Now, the book costs less than it costs to ship to you. Today, it's a, it's a very old book, uh, and it's been through numerous changes. 
Now, it's also a very Christian book, too, but uh, that's the last chapter is an extremely Christian book, uh, and it, uh, it's found in used bookstores all the time. Uh, my favorite used bookstore is Alibris, A-L-I-B-R-I-S, Alibris, for a library, Alibris. Uh, dot com and they have very good books i've been i've had much success with them so here's the humors here's what hippocrates told us the humors are developed by hippocrates they are four bodily fluids that according to hippocrates control your personality by their relative absence or presence and although we've thrown out the idea of the of the actual humors the the fluids of your body uh, we still do see that there are people who have a certain characteristic that fits them into a specific temperament. Remember, you're not just one temperament. You'll have a combination. Uh, I have a combination of two of them. My wife has a combination of two of them. And <clears throat> your strongest temperament is the one that will come out the most. And I hope you understand. What I'm saying is people are, are basically born this way. and they annoy other people that don't have the same temperament. We'll see that in just a second. So here are the different temperaments. The popular sanguine. The popular sanguine is a person who talks, 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 and is the center of attention in any party. They're the one everybody's around. They tell the greatest stories. They have the best jokes. You know, they, they are very popular. They love attention, absolutely adore attention, and that is great. That's okay but we're talking about uh, personality, uh, but a, a strong personality can become a pathology as well, because if you like attention, but you like attention so much you don't want anybody else to have attention, then you start interfering with other people when they start to get attention, that's, you're starting to become a pathology at that point. So all of these are okay to have, but when you go to the extremes in them, they become a pathology. So the popular sanguine, you probably know popular sanguines. The, uh, the head of the cheerleader squad in high school was most likely a popular sanguine. Uh, the head of the popular girls, you know, the group, the popular girls, that was probably a popular sanguine as well. So, and now there are probably other sanguines and popular sanguines in that group, but she was the strongest of all the popular sanguines in that group. So you probably know people like that. Then there's the peaceful phlegmatic. <clears throat> Oh, and sorry, the, the um, sanguine is associated with blood. So I guess if you're just way too popular sanguine, then somebody in, of course, Hippocrates' day should put leeches all over you to suck the blood out of you because you just have too much blood. <laughs> like, really? <clears throat> so we've thrown out the idea of the fluids connect, containing the uh, reason for you having that particular temperament. And we know it's something to do with the brain and, and your environment. So next one is phlegmatic. <laughs> the phlegmatic is known as the peaceful phlegmatic. My wife is very peaceful phlegmatic. It's like the, the kitchen uh, there's full of dishes that have to be done. It's like, yeah, but, you know, we haven't run out of dishes yet, so it's okay. They'll get done when they have to be done. It's just there's no reason to get them done right now. <laughs> it's peaceful phlegmatic. The... Um, the clothes are uh, filling up the hamsters, right? And there's like three of them now filled, ready to get, get washed. And she's like, yeah, but, you know, we have a fourth one. It can get filled up. You know, we don't have to do dishes. We don't have to do the, the, the laundry now. It'll get done when it has to get done. And that's, that's a peaceful phlegmatic. And my wife's very peaceful phlegmatic. Uh, I, on the other hand, am a caloric. That's not... Cleric, as in religion, it's choleric, colon, your colon, and uh, cholerics will usually have some indigestion problems and colon problems. Uh, I'm a, a very strong choleric, and my wife is a very strong phlegmatic. Opposites. And, oh, and by the way, I'll say this again in another unit, but we like to say opposites attract. Opposites do not attract. You are not attracted to somebody because they're opposite of you. You're attracted to somebody because they have the same things as you. The things that are alike are what attracts you to another person. 
it's the opposites that blend you together and make the connection strong. But you're not attracted to them because of that. You're attracted to them for the things that you are, are like. You find, if you like drinking, you're going to find somebody in a bar. <laughs> that's because you're in a bar. That's where you are. If you're religious, you're going to find somebody in church because that's where you are, or in synagogue, or in mosque, wherever it is that you go. If that You're going to find somewhere that's similar to you, and the similarities are going to attract. But the opposites will blend. And so we are a good blend, phlegmatic and choleric. And the choleric, have any of you heard the term uh, nitpicking? Yes, you have, nitpicking. Good, good. So there are managers that are micromanagers, and they nitpick. If you've ever heard of a micromanager? Have you heard of micromanagers? Yes, you all have heard of micromanagers. Okay. A micromanager will tell you what needs to get done. And a regular manager will tell you what needs to get done and then let you get it done in your way as long as it gets done. A micromanager will tell you what needs to get done and tell you exactly how it needs to get done. This is the way it should be done because it's his way. That's a choleric. That is a choleric who has gone way overboard into the pathological. <laughs> it has to be done my way. That's it. Now, a choleric is a person who enjoys being in charge. So they are managers in many cases. And if there's nobody in there's a group and there's nobody taking charge, the choleric will take charge. They will start the manage the group. And if there are two cholerics at the same level, they will butt heads against each other. So, because each one wants it done their way, and their way is not going to be the same, so they're going to butt heads. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why some presidents and vice presidents go get along together, because they're butting heads. They're the same type of temperament, and they're butting heads in the cleric. Uh, so, I, I know that I'm a cleric, and I tamp it down and just try to control myself. And that is... Every single person needs to figure out what they are and what the excess of what they are is and try not to be in the excess of what they are. So that's choleric. Now, a choleric likes to make plans. So when we go out as a family on vacation, I know exactly where we're going. I know when we're supposed to be there. I know what we're going to do. I have a plan, an itinerary. You all make itineraries? Everybody makes itineraries at some some level, mine are very, very specific itineraries. And so if I'm driving somewhere, going up to Philadelphia for vacation to see the Liberty Bell, and I take a wrong turn, and 15 minutes later I realize I made a wrong turn, I am really angry with myself. I jump to anger. I am very angry oriented. That's a choleric. And I'm really upset with myself, and I'm just berating myself for being 15 minutes outside. Now I'm going to have to turn around and go 15 minutes back. That's 30 minutes out of my time we've lost. <laughs> and my wife is sitting in the car going, yeah, but we've never been down this road before. Look. <laughs> and that's the phlegmatic in her. So we make a good pair. So the melancholy, uh, and that's called the powerful choleric peaceful, phlegmatic, and the popular sanguine. The melancholy is called the perfect melancholy. They're somewhat on the depressed side. They're not really depressed, pathologically depressed. They're just down. They're, they're down people. And they're also perfectionists. And maybe that's why they're down, because there's no such thing as perfection. And so you can never reach perfection. And so you never get where you want to go. And so you're a little bit down all the time. But they're so perfect, some of them can get way overboard in perfection. You may know people like this, or you may even see this in yourself. They'll have their closets of clothes set up so that all the long dresses are here, the short dresses are here, the skirts are here, the, uh, the blouses are here, the pants are over here, and every single one of them is set up by color as well, the whites and then the yellows and then the orange and the reds and the blues and the red and the purples. So they've got everything perfect. They are highly OCD <laughs> if they're perfectionists like that. Do you know anybody like that? Is there somebody out there that you know that's like that, or are you like that yourself? 
And that's the perfect melancholy. And what I'm trying to show you here in personality is we all have different personalities, all of us. And some of them will conflict with each other. And sometimes you meet somebody that just pisses you off. I mean, just their personality and yours do not match. They are not doing it on purpose. They're not purposely trying. They might be, but most of the time, they're not. They just met you. They're not trying to purposely upset you. They're just different than you are. Recognize there are people who are different, and it, it'll, it's okay. It's okay. They are who they are. You are who you are, and we can live together as long as we don't try to make the other person into who we are. Do you get that? I hope. I'm seeing some yeses. Okay. So that's Hippocrates, the very first true modern, 2,000 years ago, but modern doctor. We also have traits. Besides the temperaments, we have more specific, tight, tiny little traits. And the traits are a subset of the temperaments. So it's a stable personality characteristic that is presumed to exist within the individual and guide his or her thoughts and actions under various conditions. And we have tests that can measure the amount of a trait that you have. And like I said, they're a subset of the temperament. So temperaments are made up of traits. And the most well-known of all these tests is the test of the big five traits. Psychologists have gone all around the world and tested human beings and found that every human being can be measured on a scale of these big five traits. So the first one is extroversion, the opposite, you all know, introversion, and you're somewhere within that scale. I'm very high on the extroversion scale. My wife is very high on the introversion scale. Again, a perfect blending. The agreeableness or disagreeableness. My wife and I are both agreeable people. <laughs> so, but agreeableness or disagreeableness. And neuroticism, which means emotionally, no one knows what you're going to be like the day, from day to day or from hour to hour. Some people from minute to minute. They're just all over the place emotionally. Or stoic is the other side, which means non-emotional, not emotional at all. So neuroticism, stoicism. Openness to experience or closed to experience on the other side. My wife and I are both open to experience. When there's a restaurant that opens up in, Nor in, in Elizabeth City, we go to that restaurant. It can be Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, uh, Mexican, Italian. We'll go just to see what it's like. And, and she's, now she's, that was in the past. We haven't gone to a restaurant in six months. But uh, she is now vegetarian. So now we have to find out if, the, if they have vegetarian stuff for the, she, she has been vegetarian for a number of years now. I tried, I did, when she decided she wanted to be a vegetarian, I decided, okay, and so we went vegetarian for about six months, and then I told her I was going to rob the Kentucky Fried Chicken, and they can keep their money, I just wanted the chicken, <laughs> so I'm not a vegetarian any longer, again, uh, a blending, I guess, of opposites, but it was my fault that she became a vegetarian, she was watching some show on television about the Vietnamese, I think it was, or maybe the Chinese uh, eating dogs. And she said, how can anybody eat dogs? And I said, well, you know, uh, we think of dogs as pets, but uh, in China, they don't think of them as pets. And in India, they, have, they hold cows as sacred. And here we we'll eat cows. You know? And you can see any number of places where cows and goats and sheep and ducks and chickens all tend to be friends with other animals and friends with human beings, so, you know. And she said, that's it. I'm not eating anything anymore that had a face. I'm like, oh, <laughs> should have shut up. <laughs> I should never have said anything. <laughs> so she's been vegetarian ever since. And their last one is conscientious, uh, conscientiousness or non-conscientious. Now, these are fairly stable traits in a sort of way they're stable. You are born with this trait, and there is a test that we can give you, the NEOPI, which will test how much of a particular trait you are, 
And then we give that test as a child, we give that test as a teenager, we give that test as a young adult, as a middle adult, older adult, as a senior citizen, to see if there's a change in any of these five traits. And there are changes. So how can we say that they're stable? Because there are changes. But the changes are very stable. That we can predict from where you start where, you're, where you will end up. So the change is a very stable change as well, either up or down, depending on which one it is. And it turns out men and women are very different in the way that they change and way that they have their extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, open to experience, and conscientiousness. So these are personality traits that are very stable in the what you are when you're born, that's what you're going to be with a small change depending on your age. And like I said, the NEO-PI is the big five inventory that's used to study the stability of personalities over the lifespan. And the multiphasic, um, Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory is, we give these, this one to people who have a pathology of some kind. We know that there's something wrong with them. Maybe it's because of the big five. Maybe they're way off, off base on the big five. And so we can give them the big five to see where they fit in the big five to see if that might be the reason or one of the reasons why they have a pathology. And we'll talk about pathologies in the next section. So do you get the idea of the big five? We've already talked about some of the other assessments that we can give to determine what a personality is, but we haven't talked about the Rorschach inkblot test. Has anybody ever heard of the Rorschach inkblots? Have any of you ever seen a Rorschach inkblot? I should get one so I can put it online for you guys to see. Uh, they are amazing little things. And everybody's done an inkblot in, as a kid, probably. You put ink on a piece of paper, you fold the piece of paper in half, and you open it up and let it dry, and it forms some sort of pattern on the piece of paper. And that's the inkblot tests. Now, we don't do the inkblot at the time the person takes the test. These inkblots that we use, there's a number of them, that have been used for 100 years. And we have millions of people who have taken them, and we know what the normal distribution curve is of what 68% of the people say this is what that particular ink blot looks like. Like one of the ink blots looks like hip bones. It looks like hip bones. And that's typical in the 68% in the of people who say it looks like hip bones. But there are people who will say it looks like two people that just sh shot and stabbed each other and you can see the blood just hit. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, well that's really far on the edge, you know. And it doesn't mean the person is has a pathology, but they're way over on the edge, and they're on the edge. This is what people that are sociopaths and psychopaths say. So it's very possible that you might be a psychopath or a sociopath if you're saying that. We have some more things to look at first to make sure, but that's how the Rorschach works. We know after millions of people have taken it what the normal is, we know what the outside edges are, what people say, and we know what those people are like. So we know the personalities of those people who answer that particular way on the Rorschach. Does that make sense? Do you get the idea of the Rorschach tests? I should bring one in so I sh should show you one so you can, you can all decide what you think it is, right? <laughs> so that's a Rorschach inkblot test. Now, we've already talked about the TAT, the thematic A perception test, and this is actually spelled correctly. The other one was not. Uh, thematic A perception test, it's just, it's just a picture that is ambiguous that you look at and describe the picture. and how you describe the picture, because it's ambiguous, gives us an indication of your achievement level, your need to achieve, your ENOC. Right? So it's used to study achievement motivation, and that's part of personality. And that, so all of these tests, the MMPI, NEOPI, TAT, and Rorschach, have been shown to be both valid and reliable, both valid and reliable. They test what they're supposed to test. That's what valid means. They test what they're supposed to test. And they give us a score within a very close range every single time. The same score within a very narrow range of scores. Right? So we know that they're reliable. We know that they're valid. And remember, 
Just because something is reliable does not mean it's valid. My scale in the bathroom is very reliable. It gives me the exact same numbers every single time I step on it, but it's completely invalid because I've turned it back 10 pounds. Right? <laughs> However, in the sense that it is giving me a weight, it is valid because that's what valid really means is it's testing what I want it to test. Whereas the IQ, which is called intelligence quotient, is really a KQ, a knowledge quotient. It's how much knowledge you have compared to people your age. And it tells us very well how, how well you will do in school, in elementary school and high school, because we test based on age. We, we grade, we, we uh, teach based on age. At six years of age, you're in school. At seven years of age, you better know what an average seven-year-old knows or you're not going to do well. So what you learned in sixth grade and what you know in sixth grade will be useful for you in seventh grade. But it doesn't mean you're intelligent or not intelligent. Uh, if, you, if, if you just give us a test based on average facts, then that test doesn't know your experiences, and your experiences may be very different than anybody else's. So it is good as a knowledge test, but to say intelligence test, I'm not so sure that's a good idea. Not valid. There's a situation in psychology that's a controversy. Here's another controversy for you. Uh, when we say that a person is a specific type of person, is that person really that type of person? So how many of you know someone who is afraid of germs? They're just germophobic. They're just washing their hands all the time. They, don't, they stay away from you. They don't want to touch your hands. They don't want to shake your hands, right? Uh, they, don't, they don't like to go to buffets because everybody's touched that spoon that's, you know, oh, my gosh, no. They're germophobics. You guys know germophobic? Some of you say yes. Some of you say no. Well, we will call it germophobic a fraidy cat or scaredy cat, right? They're afraid. They're always afraid. They're afraid of germs. Oh, my gosh, come on. They're scaredy cats, right? But that scaredy cat who's germophobic may jump out of an airplane with a parachute, would you? Or snowboard off a cliff, would you? So we can't say that the person is a scaredy cat based on one particular aspect of their life. And it turns out that no matter what your personality is, the situation that you find yourself in can change your personality, and we'll see that when we look at, in the social psychology section, some of the experiments that they did in social psychology, Hor horrific experiments, the prison experiment number one. Have you ever seen the prison experiment film, or you know of the prison experiment? Have any of you? There's a new movie out for the prison experiment. I'll, I'll actually show you the intro for the prison experiment, the movie. Uh, when we get to that section. It's a, a pretty rough experiment. So it changed the situation for students, and they changed their personalities dramatically. So the person situation controversy is theoretical dispute concerning the relative contribution of personality factors and situational factors in controlling behavior. Uh, this is wrong. It says personality is air in which we live. No, our personality is based on the fact that we are living in air. In other words, our behaviors and our thought processes. I walk with a specific gait. If I'm walking away from you and you're my best friend and you know me very well and you only see my back but you're seeing me walk away, you know who I am because you know my walk and you know my height and other things about me. But my walk, my gait gives me away. So you can see me, and you can see how I'm walking, and that's, my, that's part of my personality, let's say. But if I get into a pool and walk, I'm walking in a completely different way inside the pool, in the water. But as soon as I get out of the water, I'm right back to the gate that I usually use. So the situation you find yourself in can change your personality. Let's say your walking is your personality, and depending on what situation you find yourself in, your personality can change. Do you get that? Do you see that? So we cannot define somebody. I see lots of yeses. So we, we cannot define somebody just by one trait. 
And we tend to do that. We, we tend to uh, look at one particular instance and say, this person is like this. That's wrong. We've got to know the whole person in order to determine what their personality is. And maybe this is going back to the cognitive psychologists, because the cognitive psychologists say, we need to discover all these little tiny pieces of personality, and we need to figure out how they work before we can tell what the overall general personality theory is. We shouldn't be figuring out now an overall all-encompassing theory of personality. We should be looking at the little pieces. And what they say, what they're saying is the little pieces, each piece is a part of personality, but we need to eventually put them all together to make a, pers a full personality. We can't define personality by one piece, but we need to know that piece. Folk theories are the way that we assume the world works, and we make predictions about how the world will work and how people we know will act. So if you know an Asian, for instance, you might think, well, Asians are really good at math, just because you've met an Asian who's very good at math. Right? Or you, um, you might, there's a really great, I like this folk theory, that women in Georgia, when they're pregnant, should eat the red Georgia clay. It's a folk wisdom. And they do. <laughs> there's lots of women in Georgia who eat red Georgia clay when they're pregnant, because supposedly they have more healthy children if they eat the red Georgia clay. So people everywhere develop implicit assumptions about personality, but these assumptions vary in important ways across different cultures. The, there was somebody that took this folk wisdom of Georgia women should eat Georgia clay, the red Georgia clay, uh, when they're pregnant, and they decided to test it, and they looked at women who had eaten red Georgia clay and women who had not eaten red Georgia clay. This is many, many, many years ago. And they found out women who eat red Georgia clay have healthier babies. <laughs> it's true. How could it possibly be true? So they studied, they did a study to try to figure out, okay, now that we know this is true, why is it true? And it turns out red Georgia clay is red because it has iron in it. And women who take iron have healthier babies than women who don't take iron. And so, yeah, don't eat the red Georgia clay. Just take iron pills. <laughs> but it was before we had iron pills. Well, you could eat the red Georgia clay, and that way you could get your iron, especially if you had an iron deficiency, which no one knew whether you did or not back in those days. So implicit personality theories, uh, assumptions about personality that are held by people to simplify the tasks of understanding other people. And unfortunately, they're not always right, and they lead to errors in judgment. We have um, the idea, like I said, that Asians are really good at math. No, Asians aren't any better than we are at math, or anybody else is at math. There are some who are good, and some who are bad. And uh, the stereotypes that we have in the world, these are folk wisdoms, stereotypes are folk wisdoms. And we make these, uh, make these implicit assumptions about other people, and one of the implicit assumptions that we make is to destroy the character of a person because they're doing something that we don't think is right. And this is called the fundamental attribution error. The fundamental attribution error is when we see somebody doing something that we think is wrong, that's not a part of society, that's the improper part of society, um, and we say that that person has, that person's an idiot, they're stupid, they're, we, we destroy their character, character assassination. Okay? Assumption that another person's behavior, especially undesirable behavior, is the result of a flaw in the personality rather than in the situation. And they occur when we do not have enough facts about it or if we don't have the correct facts. So cultural influences are fundamental attribution error as well. We make more of these errors when we're in a different culture. And I've already talked about how if you went to Greece, if, if you, and not knowing their culture, if you went to Greece and you said thank you to somebody or wave hello to somebody, <laughs> 
you're going to have a completely different reaction than you expect because this in Greece means I rub excrement in your face. Not a very nice thing to say to somebody. <laughs> Almost like uh, uh, probably worse than flipping them off in the United States. Right? So that is they would see you as, as being stupid and ignorant and dumb. They don't take into consideration you don't know their culture, and, and so they make the fundamental attribution uh, error. We know that going into our essay, right? you're talking about your essay, we're going to talk about the differences in cultures. Uh, individualism, collectivism have very different ways of looking at personality and affecting personality and other differences correlating to culture, the status of different age groups and sexes. So in some cultures, the uh, elderly are well-received. You should learn from your elders. And in other societies, more like our society, Asians, Asians are like, they are really into their, their elders and, and finding out and learning from the mistakes of the elders. And here in the United States, we're like, eh, shut up. <laughs> and uh, the sexes also completely different. Uh, elders are revered in some. Women are second class, third class citizens in some countries. In some countries and some cultures, you are, uh, if you're a woman, you stay home, you take care of the children, and you take care of the house. That's what you have to do. You do not go to college. You do not go, you, you don't even graduate from high school in some cases. You simply stay home, have babies, take care of the house. That's what your job is. Not here in the United States, of course. Here in the United States, women have the same rights and equalities as men do. If you could do a job, you should be allowed to do it. And that includes men. If a man wants to be a nurse, they should be allowed to be a nurse if they can do it. And if a woman wants to be a doctor, they should be allowed to be a doctor if they want to do it. Very different in society, different societies, cultures. Romantic love, the idea of romantic love. Well, in, in ancient times, right, it, they, they would marry their daughter and their son together in order to stop a war from happening, right? So it's a very, romantic love is a very individualistic cultural attribute. It doesn't exist in many different countries. We say, you know, I came in the room and, I, and her eyes met mine from across the room and we fell in love. <laughs> no, you didn't. You fell in lust. That's what you fell in. We don't fall in love. We fall into lust. Love takes many years to develop. You have a long time before you can connect with somebody enough to be able to say that really you love them. So romantic love is a, is a strange notion. And in collectivist cultures, you marry to improve the group. My sister is in the ultra, ultra orthodox Jewish religion. And she just declared matrimony. She said, I'm ready to get married to the rabbi. And the rabbi found a matchmaker and the matchmaker found her a husband. And now they found her four different guys who also wanted to get married, and so they dated. <laughs> they dated. Here's how they dated. The guy sat next to the rabbi. The rabbi sat next to his wife, and the wife sat next to my sister. And then the guy and my sister talked to each other across the rabbi and his wife. Why? Because in their culture, a man can only touch another man, not a woman. And a woman can only touch another woman, not a man. So, it, and that, it, not in children. Children can be held and comforted. Man and woman doesn't matter. But when you hit the age of 12 or you, for a man or uh, for a woman and 13 for a man, then the rules start to take effect at that point. And so they couldn't touch each other, but they could... Uh, when you marry, you're allowed to touch, so the rabbi and his wife could touch, but they were on opposite ends so that they didn't touch by accident. Right? And out of the four guys, she found one that she really liked, and he liked her, and so they got married. And they've been married for many, many years, and they have had eight children and four miscarriages, made 12 children altogether, and uh, they love each other at this point. But when they got together first, it wasn't love, it was convenience. It was to help the group to survive. Uh, other differences that correlate to culture also, stoicism, we've talked about 
the fact that some cultures do not show emotion, other cultures, it's okay to show emotion. So in Japan, they're very stoic. They don't show emotion out in public. At home they can, but not in public. In the United States, you can show any emotion you want to, unless you're a man, then you're not allowed to cry. <laughs> so in that particular respect, you're stoic, but otherwise you're allowed to show emotion. Uh, so Asians suppress strong emotions, and we do not. Locus of control is where do you see your locus of control? Is it external or internal? And that depends on your society as well. In China, where the government makes so many rules that, that set up your life, then they are in control, the external control. But here in the United States, it's your job to do what you want to do and get it done. Nobody's going to help you unless you ask them. So the internal locus of control. It's your locus of control, not external locus of control. Uh, in some countries, in some languages, there's one word that means both thinking and feeling. In the United States, we have both words, thinking and feeling, so we separate them, and that's where language comes into play for a personality also. And the attribution as well is, do we attribute our behavior to external forces or internal factors? And that's the end of personality. Are there any questions about personality? Um, did you like personality? Did you learn anything in this chapter about yourself or other people? Quinn liked it. Xander, yes. Jake and Ava, yes. Good. I'm glad you liked this chapter. It's, I, I find this chapter very um, amusing. <laughs> I enjoy this chapter a lot. Uh, and especially, I, that's one of the reasons I gave you the tests to take also, because knowing about yourself is important. So take the tests, see what you're like, and um, if you're willing to share, share in the box uh, next Tuesday as to what your particular answers were of your particular temperament. So let's move on then to psychopathology, if there are no questions. All right. Before I begin... You all do not have a psychopathology. You are not pathological. If you are pathological, you know it, and you are here in this class, meaning you are doing very well. You are succeeding tremendously. You have gotten this far in life with your pathology. You're taking your medications or you're seeing a therapist, whatever it is, and you know that you're, you have the pathology, and congratulations, you have gotten this far. That is great. Uh, the rest of you, you do not have a pathology. I don't care what you see in this. You're going to see a lot of things go, ooh, oh, my gosh, I have that. No, you do not have that, all right? You would have already been exposed as having that. So psychopathology. If we go back in history, way, way, way back in archaeological evidence, it shows that our, our ancestors way back when, in prehistory, before we had a history, uh, they attributed mental problems to supernatural powers, witches, warlocks, um, demons, you know, all kinds of things. The Greek physician, 2,000 years ago, the Greek physician Hippocrates determined that mental health disorders were not because of anything supernatural, but it was biological, and you can control biological. You're, you're having high blood pressure, because you're eating the wrong foods. You're allergic to a food, and you're eating that food, and you're continuously eating that food, and you're having the reaction to it, and that's why you're, it's not demon possession. You're eating the wrong foods. Right? Or there's some biologically unstable, and we can fix the unstable. But then in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church turned back time by saying, wait, wait, mental health is the soul. The reason why you have an issue is because of demon possession or your soul is there's something wrong with your soul. The soul is the area of the church. You're not allowed to study that. If you're a priest, you can study it. If you're a monk, you can study it. If you're a bishop, you can study it. But if you're not in the church, you should not be studying this, and they would excommunicate you or worse if you did. So, now, they started some beautiful, giant universities that are still going on today, but the ideas of the universities at that time when they started them were to prove the pontifications of the popes, which is a constriction of thought, not an expansion of thought. But then the Reformation came along, and uh, Luther and the others broke away from the Catholic Church, and they didn't care if you studied 
mental health. And so mental health started up again. And we've already talked about that in the first, the very first unit. But let's look at, uh, <laughs> go back to the 1500s in Salem, Massachusetts, in the colony, right, the English colony. And we have the Salem witch trials, where there were some people in the colony who went absolutely nuts, crazy. They started doing nutty things, crazy things, and they blamed it on witchcraft and demons, of course, back then. And they found the witches, and they had the witch trials, the Salem witch trials. And people today have gone to Salem, where they still have the buildings. Some of the buildings still exist. And the building where they stored their bread, they would make bread all day long. They would put the bread into this building. They would store the bread there. They would eat it as they needed it but they had a whole bunch of bread in there. Turns out that that building has the spores of psychedelic mushrooms, meaning if you ate a psychedelic mushroom, it's the same thing as taking LSD. You would freak out. So these, some of the bread in that building was growing psychedelic mushrooms, and the people who ate that bread went nuts, and they blamed it on somebody in somebody in the village right and that's where the Salem witch trials come from the history of course can go into even today um, spirits as the cause how many of you believe in spirits I'll raise my hand I believe in spirits does anybody else in the class believe in spirits some of you do yes yes I'm seeing yeses of course if you believe in the Judeo-Christian Bible, you have to believe in spirits, right? But some African tribes still attribute mental health problems to sorcery. And Haitians believe in voodoo. It's big in Haiti, voodoo. And Thais believe in spirits. And I believe in spirits, but I'm not too sure that they exist the way that they did back in the Bible days of possessions and taking control of people. Uh, I know that mental health issues are mainly caused by biological and other factors. Hippocrates was right. We can fix mental health problems with drugs and with therapy. And it turns out that therapy, some of the new research is showing that therapy does change the functioning of the brain just like drugs do, but without the drug. And without the drug, then you're not dependent upon that drug. And the drug should not be the be-all and end-all of therapy, right? Therapy should be more than just drugs. So psychopathology is any, this is a long definition, okay? Any pattern of emotions, behaviors, or thoughts inappropriate to the situation leading to personal distress and or the inability to achieve important goals in life. The important word there is a pattern. It happens over and over and over and over again. The thoughts and behaviors that you have have to be somehow distressful, not fitting into society in some way, shape, or form, which causes you to not be able to meet the demands of life. And I have here as an example, a woman outside without a burqa on in Saudi Arabia exhibits a psychopathology because she will be in jail, which means she will not be able to meet the demands of life and it will cause her distress. Now there's a caveat to that because if she was doing it on purpose, if she knows she's going to go to jail, if she knows because she is purposely uh, opposing this law by civil disobedience, she purposely goes out to get arrested but to say this is wrong and to show the, the country I'm getting arrested for this and I don't believe in it and, I don't, and you shouldn't believe in it either um, and that people can still survive in the world without having to wear burqas on, right? uh, then she's not showing a psychopathology. Then she is doing it for civil disobedience purposes. Hallucinations can be possibly, these are false sensory experiences, that may suggest mental disorders, but if you're taking LSD or some other psychedelic, you're going to be able to see uh, hallucinations. And of course, if you have uh, a HPPD, you will see hallucinations. That's a, tip, that's a different type of biological problem. 
uh, hallucinations can have other causes, right? And we've already talked about the 1980 movie uh, Altered States with William Hurt in it, where you get put into a deprivation tank. And if you're in a deprivation tank without any other senses, any of the senses coming into the brain, the brain makes up its own. So you hallucinate. Delusions are extreme disorders of thinking involving persistent false beliefs, and they are the hallmark of the paranoid disorders, and we'll talk about some paranoid disorders. And affect, I gotta apologize for science here, right? Affect means it's the same word as mood or emotion. And science just has lots of words that you have to memorize. This is what it means. Affect means mood or emotion. Just like this finger is a finger, but it's also the index finger. It's also the pointing finger, and it's also a phalange. We just have lots of words for the same thing, and unfortunately, you have to memorize the differences and know what they mean. There are two different approaches to looking at pathology, and one is the disease approach, which is the medical model. And the psychological model then sees mental disorders as an interaction of your biology, which would be the disease part, cognition, social, and other environmental factors. 15.4% of the population suffers from mental health problems at any given time. If someone does the math on that, 300 million people in the United States, 15.4% of that population is suffering from a mental health disorder of some kind. And unfortunately, Insurance companies do not look at mental health the way they look at biological health, your, your physical health. They, they look at mental health as it's easy to fix. Well, that's just simple. Saying that mental health is simple to fix is like saying a, a broken arm where the bone is sticking out of the arm is easy to fix. Just stick it back in the arm. Big deal. It is a big deal. A compound fracture is a big deal, and mental health is a big deal, and it needs to be looked at more seriously by insurance companies than it is, and by our senators and congressmen as well. 32%, another over 30, over 15% more people than those who have the mental health illness will have a symptom of mental health disorders during their lifetime, but don't have a pathology, just a symptom of it. So the medical model is the view that mental disorders are diseases that, like ordinary diseases, have objective causes and require specific treatment, most mainly. Uh, it can be surgery or it can be um, drugs. Right? And it is the doctor's knows best approach that leaves the patient as a passive participant. The doctor tells you what to do, you just do it. The psychological model takes a cognitive approach to mental health. And like I said, uh, therapy has been shown to do just as good to the brain, changing the brain and causing the brain to work more properly as drugs do, just as much as drugs do in some cases. So we call them psychogenic issues caused by psychological factors rather than as biological factors only, and patients are actively involved in helping themselves recover, actively involved. So here's um, an example or description that may show the difference between the medical model and the psychological model. I already told you my wife and I love to go to new restaurants. So we go to a new restaurant, brand new restaurant. We don't know anything about the restaurant. We sit down at a table and we're waiting for the waitress to come over and bring us our menus. There's nothing on the table. The waitress comes over. Hi, how are you doing? We're doing great. Uh, how hungry are you? She, she or he asks. Well, I'm about a seven and my wife is about a five. Okay, are you allergic to anything? He or she asks. No, no, we're not allergic to anything. Okay, great. She turns around, walks away. <laughs> and comes back with a meal that will cover my seven hunger and my wife's five hunger. That's the medical model. <laughs> That's the medical model. That's what doctors do. What's wrong with you? This, this, this. Okay, this is what you do. Goodbye. The psychological model goes is the way that we usually do. We walked into the restaurant, brand new restaurant. We're looking at the menu. Now we're looking at the menu going, well, what is this? 
You know, what does it have? The waitress or waiter is telling us all about the menu. And is there anything that people are just raving about? Is there anything you ate already on here? And we make a decision as to all the different possibilities how we're going to deal with our issue, hunger. That's the psychological approach to mental disorders. We and the therapist will talk about our issues and find the solution together. Can you imagine going to the doctor? The doctor says, you need surgery. Um, okay, so who's going to do it? You're going to do it. Oh, so you just want it for the money, right? That's why you said I need surgery. Well, let's go to the second person and find out if they can do the surgery instead. It, I still need surgery if I have to go to another person to do the surgery, or is it just because you have to do the surgery, right? Or what is surgery is the only option? What are the other options? You determine what the other options are without telling me what the other options are. You just decided this is the option that I'm going to go with. Can you imagine talking to a doctor like that? <laughs> no, they tell you what you're going to do, and that's what you're going to do. And that's the way that the medical model approaches mental health as opposed to the psychological model. Now, that's a little bit of an overstatement. You know, I know lots of psychiatrists who enjoy the drug as much as the therapy. So they'll do therapy also. Most of them will do Freudian therapy, which will take you 20 years, but uh, there are those who will do some other therapies as well. So it's not all or nothing, the spectrum. In any case, clinicians that have studied this say that there are over 300 different pathologies, and I'm not, we're not going over 300 different pathologies. We'll talk about a handful of different pathologies so you get an idea of what these different mental disorders are. Just prior to 1800, there was a man named Mesmer, and Mesmer showed that he could transfix patients. Now, we call it today hypnotism. He did not call it that. He called it transfixing. He said, I can transfix this person. And so he would show, look, look what I could do. And he did like shows all over the place. And people were starting to talk about him. Wow, did you see this guy? He was doing this work. And they didn't call it transfixing. He called it transfixing. Everybody else called it mesmerizing. Have you heard that word? Mesmerizing? That's where it comes from. Our English language word mesmerizing comes from this man, Mesmer, who was able to hypnotize people, which he did not call it that. He called it transfixing. But can you, so we can get a direct link to a word to a person, mesmerize. Now, this idea, this, this way that he did this, he trained other people and they, they trained to do this and it influenced a young French physician named Jean-Martin Charcot, and he used hypnotism, and he studied it in a laboratory. He studied, how can I use this to help my patients? Well, he was especially interested in hysterical patients. We don't talk about hysteria anymore. We have another conversion. We talk about it a different way today rather than hysterical patients. But one of Charcot's students in the winter of 1885 to 1886 was Sigmund Freud. And it was work with hypnotism that showed Freud that there was something hidden inside the mind that influenced our behavior. Because later, he worked with Dr. Joseph Brower. And Dr. Brower had a patient named Anna O. Oh. That's not her name. They used a different name for this woman. We now know who she is. I can't remember her name at the moment. It starts with a B. But uh, she actually became a social worker later in Germany and one of the very first social workers and has a stamp in her honor in Germany. But she was one of the patients of Dr. Joseph Brower and Dr. Joseph Brower and Sigmund Freud talked together about this patient. And Anna O would, was opposed to water. She would not drink water. She got all of her liquids from fruits like watermelon and um, melons, so she could get her, her liquid, but she would not drink water. One day when she was under hypnosis, and she actually, uh, she actually did her own hypnosis, Brower did not have to hypnotize her. She had something she called chimney sweeping was what she called it. But she went into this trance, and while she was in the trance with Dr. Joseph Brower asking her questions and starting to get to know her, uh, what, she, what was going on, she remembered an event in her past. And the event was a party. She was at a party, 
and there was a person sitting in a low-lying chair on the ground who was drinking some water from a glass, and that person put the glass on the ground next to them and then turned in the other direction to talk to somebody, and on the, in the woods that were on the other side, there was a dog that came out of the woods, and that dog, she saw the dog, and the dog was diseased. It was a mongrel, mangy dog, and it drank out of the water glass and then ran back into the woods. And the man, not knowing it, picked up the glass and drank from it. And it freaked her out, and she decided she was never going to drink water ever again. Now, that's <laughs> illogical, right? But she had this thing that happened, and it was so horrible, she repressed the memory. She didn't even remember that it existed. It was such a terrible event in her life. But she would not drink water. While she was under this trance, she remembered that event. When she came out of it, she still remembered the event, and she could then consciously say, well, that was really stupid. Um, it was just that one event, and that was that water in that glass, not water I get from anywhere else. And so she was able to drink water again, and Freud's like, oh, my gosh, repressed memory coming back changed her behavior. Here's, here's where repressed memories come from. So that was uh, Dr. Joseph Brower's influences on mental disorders and how repressed memories might be part of that. So there are different approaches to looking at mental disorders for psychologists. This, the cognitive perspective, which is abnormal behaviors are influenced by mental processes, how people perceive themselves in the relationship to other people. Then there's the behaviorist approach, right? Rewards and punishments. Abnormal behaviors can be acquired through behavioral learning, operant and classical conditioning. We've already talked about them in the learning chapters. And there's another uh, obvious, there's biological reasons why you might have uh, problems. Uh, the biologists, the biopsychologists, they study the brain and its functions associated with mental health. And there are obvious genetic connections. We know depression is associated with the serotonin gene, the short version of the serotonin gene. So there's genetic factors that contribute to mental disorders. But we don't look at them as this is the reason, this is the reason, this is the reason. It's always a combination, an interaction of things. So an interactionist view says that biological, behavioral, cognitive, and the environment all combine together to produce this behavior. And here's an example of it. For instance, a person is predisposed to depression. They have this, the short serotonin gene. So they're predisposed to the possibility of depression. And we will see that there are some of these issues, pathological issues, that are genetic, related to genetics, and that you have a higher percentage chance of having them if your parents have them. And then they're overworked, and so they're stressed out. Well, stress is a, we've already talked about how stress affects you. And then their car breaks down, their child gets sick. These are environmental factors that increase the stress even more. And their thoughts, their cognition turns negative, and then they spiral into despair. And that despair turns into depression. And this is the interactionist approach that says it's not just one thing. It's a combination of things that causes our pathologies. So if the behaviors or thoughts are statistically rare, statistically rare meaning they're outside the norms, all right? We have the normal population distribution curve. 68% of us fit in the middle. Those particular behaviors are considered normal. Anything outside is considered abnormal, but not necessarily pathological. They may be considered abnormal, but not necessarily pathological. If the behaviors or thoughts deviate from acceptable social norms, get this, social norms, standards and values, they may be considered abnormal, but not necessarily pathological. I like to use the Yanomamo of Brazil. Have you ever heard of the tribe, the Yanomamo tribe of Brazil and Venezuela? Have any of you heard the, the term, the Yanomamos? No? Okay. I'm seeing one no. The rest of you? No. Two no's. Three no's. Okay. So mostly you don't, you're not recognizing the name. The Yanomamo is a tribe in the jungles of Brazil and Venezuela. It is against the law in Brazil to interact with them. 
They are a tribe in and of themselves and away from society, from the normal society of Brazil and Venezuela. They uh, do not have con contact with the outside world. And there are people who have studied them. And they have a particular religious ceremony that they do. And basically, they take cocaine and they sniff it up their nose. Now, they don't just sniff it like we see people sniffing cocaine in, you know, movies. They have cocaine put into a pipe. The pipe is put up into their nose. They sniff it in from the pipe. But on the other end of the pipe, somebody is blowing it into their nose. It goes way up into their navel cavity. And then they have a religious experience. Now, that's against the law here in the United States. But uh, aside from that, what happens when, this, when they do it often enough is that they damage their nasal passage and they have mucus that comes out of their nose a lot. So that in itself is ugh. But let me take one more step further than that. They have long hair. They don't have barbers. They have long hair. And to keep their long hair nicely back, they just take that mucus and they put it on their hair as dippity do. Ew! Ew! <laughs> that is totally unhygienic. If they were here in the United States, they would never get a job. They would probably not have many friends. I don't know that they would get a rental, you know, from rents. Uh, and they're just, they would not fit into society and they would have a problem getting anything. They would not be able to meet the demands of the world, of the United States. But in their own society, it is not a pathology. It is typical behavior. Typical behavior. Here in the United States, it's abnormal behavior and abnormal enough. And with its other aspects, they would not be able to meet the demands of life. So it's a pathology in the United States, but not in their own country. Do, do you get that? I mean, here in France, in France, there, most beaches are open beaches, topless. There, there's no reason for a woman to have a bikini top on. Here in the United States, you'd be in jail if you did that, except if you're at one of the beaches, you know, nude beaches or a, a nudist colony somewhere. Uh, but the typical society, you cannot just walk around without a top on women. Men can, even if their breasts are as big as a woman's, they're still allowed to walk around. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> so we have very specific differences between societies. This is part of your ideas that I'm giving you for your whole essay on the differences in cultures and psychology. So here in the United States, there's a, I used to live in San Diego, and across from the bay in San Diego is Black's Beach. Black's Beach is a nudist colony beach, nudist beach. And you can't see it from San Diego. You'd have to have binoculars to look at it. Uh, but I understand people have said to me that they've looked from San Diego to Black's Beach. I never had the intention to do so. And they said, you know, people that are on Black's Beach, you don't want to see them naked. <laughs> They are, <laughs> so, but very different uh, society rules and regulations. And so our personalities are based on also our rules and regulations of our society. And we think very differently than other people do. There are a number of ideologies uh, that means the causes of, or the factors that are related to a specific disorder. And depending on the disorder that you have, uh, this, it, what you decide, how you decide the disorder is how many ideologies you have and you follow the ideologies down to a particular disorder. So we don't say you have this and then try to find the reasons for it. We look at the reasons, the things you have, the ideologies, the factors, the causes, and then that leads us to a particular pathology. So we have distress, irrationality, unconventional and undesirable behavior, like Juliana Mamo of Brazil, uh, maladaptive behaviors, unpredictable behaviors, and observer discomfort. 
people who, who create observer discomfort. This is called bullies in the world, bullies in the world. We'll talk about that too. And we'll talk about it next time we come back because we're pretty much near the end of the class. So I'm going to stop right here on page 12. If you have any questions, stay and talk to me, and I'll be glad to talk to you about whatever it is you need to discuss. And if not, have a very good weekend. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye. Y'all gone? Everybody's gone. Okay.